welcome back, Bulls Nation, to another episode of Nothing But Bull. I'm your host, Derek, and today we have a very special guest. He is the Windy City Bulls commentator. Uh, he works with ABC7 Chicago sports anchor and a co-host with Stacey King on Give Me the Hot Sauce. Mark Shanowski, how you doing, Mark? I'm doing very well. Thank you so much for having me on today. Thanks for coming. Of course, I have Justin. How's everybody doing? Um, Great. With uh, having Mark on here, you know, we've had, we, we've talked with Stacy before and we got a chance to meet Tim uh, last week. Um, but just having somebody of your stature who's been in the, in the business for what, over, over 30 years uh, now? Um, I got to tell you, I was really nervous about this show. <laughs> I mean, my, my armpits are, are my armpits are, are literally a, a crying right now. So <laughs> I'm just uh, just excited to be around you. That's too much information, Justin. <laughs> I, I thought this was a safe place for us to share. So, <laughs> and of course, Melissa. Hello, hello. Hope everybody's doing good. Um, I'm also a little nervous about this one, but I, I can't say the same about my armpits. I keep them dry and good. <laughs> so, um, we're just we're just honored to have you on. So appreciate you taking the time with us today. Thank you. Yeah, it's been a great couple of years for Bulls fans with all the changes to the roster and the team performing so well last year. And I know people are excited about the upcoming season and everything that's going on this summer in the NBA. So whatever questions you guys have, I'm happy to answer them. Awesome. Before we get into Bulls, um, yesterday was the passing of the legendary Bill Russell, um, 11-time NBA champion. Uh, he did so much for not only the sport, but also the community. He was a community leader. Um, now, he was before our time to see him play and Really didn't see many highlights of Bill Russell, but Mark, did you, you have like stories or experiences of what you've watched or if you met Bill Russell? Yeah, I'm old, but I'm not quite that old to uh, have experienced all of uh, Bill Russell's career. When I was a young guy growing up in Milwaukee, there were only like 10 teams in the league, and it seemed like every Sunday – it was the Philadelphia 76ers against the Boston Celtics with Bill Russell playing Will Chamberlain. And that was my first experience to the league as a boy was watching those games. And I, and I remember I was kind of a Wilt fan because I just liked the the dominant giant who had scored 100 points in a game. I mean, I, he was just a spectacular athlete. So I was kind of rooted for the 76ers in those games. And it seemed like no matter what Wilt did, he would always lose to Bill Russell. And the interesting thing about that was that those guys – were fast friends. You know, they used to go to each other's house and they did a lot of things socially. But I think towards the end of their careers, Wilt kind of got tired of getting beaten down by Russell Celtics so many times that they kind of had a little bit of a falling out. But after their playing careers were done, they got back together again, had a great relationship until Wilt died. And, and Bill Russell, of course, for all his accomplishments, 11 championships and 13 NBA seasons, which will never happen again, you know, he's re being remembered over the last couple of days for all the work he did off the court. He was a civil rights activist. He spoke out on so many social causes. And that's why he's so beloved. You're seeing shows devoting their entire content to memories of Bill Russell. And very few athletes deserve or get that kind of treatment in their passing. But Bill Russell is definitely one of them. He's definitely um, being in a lot, of, a lot of love from not only just NBA players, but like people from around the world, um, he was very beloved. Um, share my screen. Um, Just piggybacking off of what you were saying, uh, Mark, it, it's you know, with with the time period that he lived in, of course, there wasn't anything like a brand. Um, but we see that really he used his platform as a means to really help uh, a lot of people and, and speak out. Uh, he wasn't um, braggadocious, but he, he was brash and he really uh, pushed the envelope as far as uh, working through different um, uh, social initiatives. 
And um, it's rare that when you see someone like him with his stature, with everything that he's accomplished in the league, like everybody pretty much has the same memories of him, of just uh, not only his excellence as a as an NBA champion and, and all of the other accolades that he did um, within the sport, uh, but just uh, people having so many stories of him reaching out and and really being uh, that that voice for this generation for people to look up to. And even after his playing career, he became really close to a lot of NBA stars and all really all current members of the Boston Celtics. Just over the last day, I've heard stories from Julia Serving and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar talking about Bill Russell seeking them out to give them some counsel, not only about life in the NBA, but life in general as a young, famous black athlete. And, you know, Bill Russell would go out of his way to try to make himself a resource. Uh, Kevin Garnett, who finished his career, didn't finish it, but uh, won a championship with the Boston Celtics when he first arrived in Boston. Bill Russell sought him out to try to make him feel comfortable in that setting and saying that he was always going to be there if Kevin needed any help. Um, And you hear those stories from so many current uh, players about how Bill Russell was a factor in their lives and that Bill was always at the finals. He was at the all-star games. Of course, the finals trophy is now named the Bill Russell trophy. He was the greatest winner in the history of professional sports, but he never put himself above those others that were striving to reach the pinnacle that he had reached in the sport. So, you know, you really appreciate an athlete and a person who's willing to give up himself to help people who are younger and are trying to achieve some of the things that he did. He could have just stepped away from the game and saying, you know, I won more championships than anybody else and I've got nothing left to offer the game. But up until his dying day, you know, he was he was a guy who sought out current players and tried to make their lives better by giving some of the wisdom that, that he learned over the course of his long time in the game. Finally got my screen working. Um, let's see, Michael Jordan issued a statement. Uh, Bill Russell was a pioneer, as a player, as a champion, as the NBA's first black head coach, and as an activist. He paved the way and set an example for every black player who came into the league after him, including me. The world has lost the legend. My condolence to his family, and may he rest in peace. Yeah, and Michael Jordan, of course, another player that Bill Russell sought out and tried to give him some of the, the wisdom that he'd accumulated over the years. And it's it's interesting that when you see some of these videos, you know, they had the NBA 75 gathering uh, this past season during the All-Star break. And anybody who had a chance to, to be in contact with Bill Russell just came away amazed. I mean, you see people like Michael Jordan and LeBron James just uh, just in awe of a player who had accomplished so much not only in basketball, but in life as, as Bill Russell. And, and his legacy will live on forever. He will always be, when you consider the giants of the game, Bill Russell will definitely be one of the first names that come to mind. Yeah, he's regarded as like Babe Ruth of basketball. I think, yeah, that's, no I think that's what Adam Silver said about him, if I remember correctly. Um, he's, he's had such a great impact, like everybody's saying, just to piggyback on and off the court, civil rights activist, He's a pioneer. He's like one of the greatest players of all time, of course. Um, he was until it, it's right up there with Jordan. I, I they're, they're right neck and neck, but um, that's besides the point. It's just a, a, a huge loss. Um, I think he was also awarded um, a medal by Barack, too, I think. in like Yeah, the, the Presidential Medal of Freedom, which yeah. is the highest honor any c- civilian can get. And, and yes. Bill Russell, for all his work on the civil rights front was awarded that honor by president Obama. So yeah, I mean, the things that he's accomplished, you couldn't begin to list all the things that Bill Russell did in a life well lived and, and he will be missed. You know, when you consider the Mount Rushmore of basketball, you can argue about who might've had the greatest stats, but when you consider an impact on the game, uh, Bill Russell would have to be on that Mount Rushmore. Definitely. One of the things that really amazes me, um, with Russell and um, even guys um, earlier uh, with, uh, with Jerry West, uh, guys that have been around and had a tremendous impact on the league was uh, just the fact that he was able to stay up to date and current with what was going on in the NBA. And it really got me to thinking about, like you just mentioned about how that the 75th anniversary uh, that they had um, with all of these great players. And it made me think about just the fact that, uh, the league, like we, 
think of, well, at least in my terms, I think about it as being around for a long time, but it really hasn't. You know, um, when you compare it to other sports like uh, baseball and uh, football, uh, but just the fact uh, that we have these great players that uh, other great players can look at and reach out to, um, do you uh, think that that will kind of uh, change the talk that we've kind of seen uh, coming from some some current players today about, you know, eras and all of this other things? Or do you think that we'll see more uh, players uh, just like embracing the history of the NBA? I think in any sport, there's always a recency bias. You know, people who are currently in the game have a tendency to underestimate what had been accomplished by athletes before them. When Bill Russell was drafted into the league out of the University of San Francisco, that was in 1956, the league was only nine years old. So when you consider what a pioneer he was in terms of, of coming into the game and leading the Celtics to all those championships, well, you know, the current players sometimes, you know, we saw the comment from J.J. Redick a little a little while ago. He's, he was kind of downgrading Jerry West, saying that he was playing against plumbers and stuff. And it's like uh, that that's just a just a very uh, – unknowledgeable comment to make. I mean, I did see Jerry West play. Jerry West was a bad man. I mean, he could score against anybody. Uh, he averaged 30 points in the league. He was also among the league leaders in assists. He took the Lakers to the finals just about every year. Unfortunately, they always ran into Bill Russell's Celtics. But, you know, when you consider some of the great players in the 60s and 70s, they certainly could compete with anybody who's playing today. And I think, you know, the athletes, yes, they're they're bigger and stronger and, and faster to a large degree. But when you consider the skill level and the things that some of those older players could do on the court, they would match up very nicely with a lot of the stars of today's game. Yeah, my first introduction to, to just learning about uh, Russell was uh, when I was growing up, of course, you know, Jordan was the man. Everybody was talking about Jordan and we still talk about Jordan uh, today. But every single time I would tell my dad about Jordan, he would just shake his head and say, you got to look at Russell. You got to look yeah. at Russell. <laughs> and I was like, Dad, what made what made this guy so special? And he just would just shake his head and say he was just a, a pure uh, winner. Like anything that needed to be done, uh, he would do on that court in order to make his, his teammates better. And one of the things that I noticed, like when I was younger, was just as, a, as far as like how different it is today, whenever I would see him blocking shots, he was never like trying to like block it into the crowd. Like he was trying to uh, tip it and, you know, get his other teammates on the fast break. And that's one of the things that I always appreciated about him. Didn't get a chance to see obviously him play, but just the highlights and everything, how he would get his, his teammates involved um, and like how they benefited from playing with, with such a, um, a selfless player like, well, Bill Russell didn't really care about statistics. You know, he averaged 22 and a half rebounds for his career. I mean, 22 and a half rebounds per game, which is remarkable. And remember back then, the blocked shot was not an official statistic. So we have no idea how many shots Bill Russell blocked. You mentioned the fact that he took such great pride in not trying to swat it in the crowd, but to deflect it to a teammate so they could start a fast break going the other way and hopefully get a couple of easy points that way. Russell would probably would have averaged anywhere from four to eight block shots a game, which would dwarf what we're seeing in the numbers today. So that wasn't even an official stat back then. And, and when you consider the totality of his accomplishments, that's one of the things people need to remember is that he's not even recognized for all the shots he blocked in his career. That is amazing. <laughs> okay. Mark, I'm going to ask you, um, you're the winning city bulls commentator. So you get a lot, to see a lot of Marco Samanovic. What do you think would it take for him to get meaningful minutes with the Bulls this upcoming season? That's quite a tr uh, transition we're making from Bill Russell, the greatest <laughs> shot blocker and center in the game, to Marco Samanovic. So, but I understand, you know, we got to move it along to the, to the current game. Yeah, I, I did get a chance to see all his home games last season. I thought Marco made great strides from the start of the season in October to the end of the season in the beginning of April. I thought that he really showed progress in terms of his court recognition, his passing ability. Uh, he became more confident in shooting with a little bit better range than he had at the start of the season. 
I think offensively there's a lot there. He can score in the post. He's got a nice touch. He shot a high percentage from the free throw line. Uh, he didn't shoot well from the three-point line, but I think that's something that he can develop over time where he can be a threat from out there. My biggest concerns for him are, are the strength issue. You know, he did say he put on 25 pounds of muscle during this summer, and he did look better in summer league. I thought he played well in those games. But the reality of it is, to answer your question directly, you know, they signed Andre Drummond, and they have Nikola Vucevic. So there's really no minutes left for Marco Simonovic at the center position. And I know I've had people on Twitter saying, well, why don't they play him at power forward? He could back up Patrick Williams. Listen, for somebody who's seen Marco play, he's not a power forward. He's a center. He, he's not, he doesn't have the, the, the foot quickness, lateral quickness to be able to guard players out in space. And I, and I think it's going to be difficult for him, especially at the NBA level, to try to guard opposing power forwards. You know, one of the things we've seen that, that's really taken the big man out of the game is the fact that they, they can't move quickly enough to switch on pick and roll because it's a pick and roll league. You know, you see, you see Steph Curry and so many great guards running off screens. And if the big man can't come out to at least show on that screen, it's going to be an easy bucket for, for the guard. So um, I think Simonovic is going to have to earn the confidence of the coaching staff first. Billy Donovan bluntly said last year that he's not ready to contribute on the NBA level. Hopefully he plays well in training camp, plays well in preseason games, and maybe gets a chance to get some whatever spare minutes might be available. But I think Marco's going to be logging a lot of minutes for the Windy City Bulls again this season because of the fact that most of the minutes at center are already taken up. Yeah, Billy is uh, usually pretty tight-lipped about where his players are as far as their development. But yeah. he, he pretty much shot that theory down right yeah. away. Not ready. Yeah, he, he was very blunt about it. As you mentioned, it was uncharacteristic because Billy is very well, uh, does a really good job in, in interacting with the media. And he'll give you information, but he's never going to disparage one of his players. And I think that was about as close as he came saying, you know, this kid's not ready. But, you know, he's only 23, 24 years old. He's got – actually, I think he's 22. So he's he's got time to develop. It's just where is he going to get the minutes? I think he's going to have to kind of swallow his pride and, and try to dominate – at the G league level and maybe force his way into more minutes. And it may turn out ultimately that, that he doesn't play for the bulls. He ends up going somewhere else, but Vucevic only has this coming season left on his contract. Andre Drummond signed at one of those one in one deals where he'll have a player option after next year. So maybe after next season, if Simonovic plays well in the G league and really dominates at that level, maybe he does figure in as, as either, uh, a starter or a number two center for the Bulls in the year after next. You did mention that he was uh, working on his strength. Did you get a chance to ask Marco who he was flexing on? Uh, Cause we're, we're st all still trying to figure that out. Who was he directing that energy to, or, or was that something that just came out of him uh, during that summer league game? I think that was just kind of to show everybody that he's, a much different player than he was a year ago. Because remember, when he first played in Summer League back in 2021, he did not fare very well, and he got pushed around a lot. And I think that was kind of his message. Remember, Billy Donovan and Arturis Karnischewicz were sitting in the front row. So I'm sure he did it for their benefit. He did it for Bulls fans' benefit. And he did it for everybody around the league to show that I'm here and I'm going to stay. I'm not just going to consider this a failure and, and go back to Europe with my tail between my legs. Yeah, a lot of people were excited about those couple games. Like, there was a lot of hype around that. And, you know, you know how especially Twitter reacts. It's like, Marco Hours, he's going to be MVP. Like, kind of joking around. But um, it sure. was, nonetheless, it was nice to see his confidence. And he was, he bulked up. So that was good. He was playing a lot more aggressively. But I kind of, I think I kind of agree with you. Um, I don't, I don't know that he's NBA ready yet. But um, it would be nice for him to get some hours, though. I have some minutes. <laughs> we, he definitely yeah, I, I think that people have to stay patient with Marco. It's still a work in progress. Remember, he came over from Europe at a very young age, and people always want to compare him to the two-time MVP, Nikola Jokic, who our tourist was able to help draft in the second round when he was at Denver. Well, that was a rare success story. I mean, if, if Marco could develop into a solid NBA backup, I think that'd be a very good value for a second-round pick. Um, you um, have been the voice of the Windy City Bulls for, for how long now? It's only been a couple of years. Remember, they didn't compete in the uh, bubble season they had in the G League, so they basically took a year off. I've been there the last three years, but the middle year they didn't compete. 
Um, so it's been interesting to be out there and, and see the development of some of the young guys. They do a nice job with player development out at Windy City. And, you know, hopefully that's going to be a more important piece in the development of guys as we go forward. I know a lot of NBA teams now are starting to make better use of their G League teams and not only putting fringe players down there, but putting some of their draft picks to develop. We may see Dalen Terry play some games for the Windy City Bulls because I don't think there's a lot of rotation minutes for him with uh, the, the parent Bulls. So I wouldn't be surprised if we see Terry a little bit in the G League. I thought we'd see Io DeSumo last year, but he played so well, and there were some injuries at the guard spot early in the year that he was able to play the entire season with the Bulls and made second team all rookie. I mean, his success story was pretty remarkable. And I'm sure you've all seen the photos of him in the weight room. It looks like he's uh, he's really jacking himself up for this uh, for this second season in the NBA. And, and I think that Iowa will be bigger, stronger, and even more effective in year two. Io was like the still of the draft last season. And, yeah. Yeah. Uh, with with Io developing like that, and hopefully a healthy Lonzo Ball, and we got AC. Hopefully he's healthy as well. That still kind of leaves Kobe as the odd man out. And I've seen like a report. Uh, I think it was Bleacher Report put out that uh, the Bulls are still contemplating moving Kobe at the deadline. Do you think it's real? listing that he stays this season or he's moved. Yeah, that was a report by Joe Colley of the Sun Times over the weekend saying that uh, the, the Bulls have been looking at possible trades involving Kobe White for going on a year now, going back to last summer. And I think the, the thing you have to realize are the economics that are involved. Kobe White was the seventh pick in the 2019 draft, which means he's due about $7 million for the upcoming season. That's a lot of money to pay for your fifth guard, and he'll be eligible for a rookie extension up until opening night of the coming season. I don't think the Bulls are going to extend that contract. I think they're just going to let him play it out and see what happens. They'll probably make a qualifying offer so they can retain rights to match, but they're not going to, they're not going to give him a long-term extension because if you're Kobe White's agent, you're just – comparing him to other players that were drafted in the same range and you're saying player X got a four-year deal for $48 million and he was drafted in the same range as Kobe White. That's what we want. Well, the Bulls are going to come back and say, well, he kind of fell back in the rotation. Io DeSumo kind of passed him up. He's behind Alex Caruso. You know, if if Lonzo Ball and and Zach are healthy, Kobe White's the fifth guard and there's not a lot of minutes for a fifth guard. I'm kind of surprised, honestly, that he's still on the team. I thought he'd be traded before the draft so that the Bulls could either move up in the first round or maybe get an additional first-round pick. I think that his long-term future will be with another NBA team because the Bulls are just stocked at that guard position. Kobe's a nice player. You know, he can score in bunches. He's got that quick strike ability that the Bulls used to see with guys like Jamal Crawford and Ben Gordon coming off the bench. And I think Kobe White is a very good offensive weapon. The problem is with all the roster additions they've made in the past couple of seasons, he is not going to get major minutes. And now they've brought Goran Dragic in, which was kind of a puzzling move to me. And Dragic was quoted back uh, in the media in his native Slovenia saying that one of the reasons he signed with the Bulls is that they kind of promised him that he'd play about 20 minutes a game, which boggles my mind because I don't know where those 20 minutes are coming from. (laughs) Stacy said the same thing when he was on. Yeah, crazy. (laughs) With that being said, though, um, with the uncertainty of, of ball, do you think that that buys Kobe just a little bit of time? I think if uh, AK and Mark Eversley could find the right return, they trade him tomorrow and would have traded him on draft night. I think right now he's a bit of a depreciated asset. You know, as I mentioned, they took him seventh overall, and you don't want to just give him away for a second round draft pick or a guy that's not going to figure in your rotation. Uh, I think what they're hoping is that they can find the right situation, whether whether a team uh, has a player who doesn't play very well in training camp or they have an injury and they have a need at the, at a, as for a combo guard who can score, that maybe they want to take a look at Kobe. But, you know, Kobe was drafted by uh, Gar Foreman and John Pax, and that was not uh, a draft pick of the current regime. So they really don't have any long-term allegiance to Kobe. I think they respect what he, what he brings as a, as a, as a uh, volume score, but I think also – 
he is not somebody who really fits in their long-term vision of what the Bulls are going to be ultimately. So I, I still think that's someone to watch for in a trade down the road. It could come in training camp. It could come at the trade deadline. But uh, I think they would like to move him and get something back rather than just see him walk away in free agency next summer. Yeah, um, definitely. Um, like I said, he's the fifth guard in the rotation. And if everybody's healthy, it's like, where does he even figure into this team? It's- yeah, I mean, that's that's the problem. I mean, Billy Donovan can't play six guards when you consider uh, Goran Dragic as well. That, that's six guys, and really, an ideal NBA rotation is nine players. Billy at times would go 10, 11, 12 deep because he had so many guys that he thought he, he needed to get in there. You know, if he tries to find some spare minutes for Dalen Terry and Javante Green, it's really going to get unmanageable. Derek Jones Jr. is back. Uh, you know, it's not like the Bulls are – the greatest team in the league, but they have a lot of players of similar ability that, you know, who's going to play and who's not going to play. And for any NBA coach will tell you, if you try to rotate 12, 13 guys on a nightly basis, you're just messing up everybody. So Billy's going to have to make some hard decisions during training camp as to which nine or 10 guys he wants to use. And as I mentioned, if Dalen Terry is not in that group, then he's going to just have to swallow his pride and he have to play some G league minutes. You mentioned Daly, Dale and Terry, um, and I, I think everybody has kind of like gravitated to the the energy that he has on the court and just what he's shown uh, in the couple of games that we've been able to see. But what are the, the realistic chances that he can have an impact um, on this team in his rookie year? I would say they're very slim, but I would have told you the same thing about Io DeSumo last year at this time. As I mentioned, I thought Io was destined for a lot of time with the Windy City Bulls, but circumstances changed and he got his opportunity. Same thing could happen for Dale and Terry, but unfortunately that would probably only happen if the Bulls have a lot of injuries. And for all of us who are longtime Bulls fans, the last thing we want to see is more injuries. We've seen so many seasons disrupted by guys getting hurt over the last few years that you just hope that they can stay healthy and see what this team can become. Dale and Terry needs to put on weight and strength. You know, we talked about Simonovich earlier uh, obviously different for a big man, but but Terry is, is painfully thin right now. And, and I think he's gonna, he needs a year in that NBA weight room to get stronger. He's uh, a rangy athlete with a good wingspan, almost at seven feet. And I think that he could be a, a really good defensive disruptor. He could play passing lanes. He could get out of the fast break. He could finish in transition. I think eventually he can be a very nice piece. But as a rookie, I think it's going to be very difficult for him to get into that rotation. Yeah, we need him to work on his shooting too. Um, he, yeah. He's definitely bringing great energy, and I, I love that leadership that he's bringing. But um, if we can get him on ball with shooting, that would be that would be great. So something we got to work on and developing him. I, I wonder. Well, who do you think if um, if Zoe isn't ready to start the season? Because I know we're hearing a lot of different opinions on if he's ready or if he's not going to be ready. Who do you think would be the best fit for our starting point guard? I think the best fit would probably be Io DeSumo, but I I think that Billy might go with the veteran and Alex Caruso. You know, I think that Caruso has probably earned that opportunity to be the starter if Lonzo's out. And obviously his standing in the league might jump him over Io. But, you know, he could go any different number of ways. He could start Goran Dragic if he wanted to and just play him for short minutes and then go with uh, Caruso and Io off the bench. Uh, A lot of different opportunities, but... As I mentioned, if Lonzo's healthy and you've got six guards, Billy is going to have some have a tough time trying to figure out how to rotate minutes there. It's uh, it's great to have that kind of depth, but it's also difficult for a coach when all, you feel like all these guys have done enough to earn playing time. I just don't have the minutes to give them. So I'm hoping Lonzo is ready to go because we saw the impact he made on the team last season. Really, DeMar DeRozan was unbelievable, uh, an MVP candidate for most of the year, put up the best stats of his career, and no one could have anticipated he would put up those kinds of numbers. But I would think that Lonzo Ball, the things he did at both ends in terms of what he did in shutting down opposing point guards, playing the passing lanes, pushing the ball in transition. Don't forget, he he was shooting like 41% from three-point range on pretty high volume. He was doing a lot of the things that this team really needs to be special. They're good without him. They, They have the potential to be a top four team in the East with a fully healthy 
and uh, functioning Lonzo Ball playing at his peak. Yeah, the, the Bulls are just so unbelievably fast when Lonzo's healthy and AC's healthy. Mm-hmm. The way that they push the ball, the game is just completely different. Um, I'm hoping, I'm hoping that's that's like our biggest opportunity is just keeping everybody healthy. So it's just something. Yeah, I, I think that if, if that team would have been able to keep the same rotations as they had during the first two-thirds of the season, remember at the All-Star break, they were tied with Miami for the best record in the Eastern Conference, and they kind of dropped off because they lost that defensive energy that Lonzo and Alex Caruso had brought. They weren't getting as many easy baskets in transition. Their three-point percentage really dropped without Lonzo out there on the court. I think if this team is 100% healthy, they can do some special things. I think I think Boston and Milwaukee are the two clear-cut top seeds in the East, but after that, every team has their question marks. You know, Philadelphia – is feeling good about themselves. They made some nice additions this summer. They're hoping they're going to get a more effective James Harden this year. You look at what Miami did last year, having the best record in the conference. They're bringing everybody back. We don't know what's going to happen with Brooklyn, you know, whether they trade Kevin Durant, Kyrie Irving, or both. So they're kind of an unknown right now. But even if they bring back the the squad they had last year, they're, they're a threat to be top four in the East. And Atlanta made some good moves, bringing in DeJounte Murray. So there's a lot of strong teams in the East. If the Bulls want to get one of those top four spots which brings home court advantage in the first round they're going to have to have everybody healthy and playing at a very high level you know they they had a great season last year it was a great transition year but if they want to stay in that race for a top four seed in the east they're going to have to have good health and have guys playing at a high level again you mentioned the the question marks um and all of the teams have them and as you mentioned health is going to be a question mark for us at the beginning of the year um but one question mark that i i think um that I, I really look at is um, the importance of Patrick Williams. Um, how important is it for him to, to have a, a really um, big year this year in order for the team to reach their goals moving forward? Because I know I've been reading some certain things from uh, certain front office people who think that the bulls might've overvalued uh, Patrick Williams and what he brings to the team. Um, you know, there are a lot of people who are saying that the bulls should have, gotten into the uh, Rudy Gobert Gobert, uh, sweepstakes, which I I didn't agree with. But there was, um, you know, that attention that people were were bringing on the Bulls for that. So how important is he uh, to their future success? He is absolutely critical. When you look at the roster, we already talked about the glut they have at the guard spot. And they played Javante Green as the starting power forward for a good chunk of last season. And Javante Green's only 6'4". Derek Jones is 6'5". So they don't have any size. So Patrick Williams at 6'7", with a long wingspan, is the closest they think they have to a legitimate power forward. He's going to have to play a lot of minutes, and he's going to have to play well. But one thing that's really encouraging, we had Patrick on our Give Me the Hot Sauce podcast a few weeks ago, and he talked about his early morning workouts with DeMar DeRozan in Los Angeles. He flew out to L.A. to work with DeMar, and you couldn't pick a better guy to try to study from, especially when you look at Patrick Williams' game, where I think that, He is going to be similar to DeMar. He's going to be a guy who gets a lot of his points in the mid-range. He's good at at the two-dribble pull-up jump shot, and and I think that's something that DeMar can really help him perfect, work on some shot fake moves that can get him more trips to the free throw line, and, of course, he'll continue to try to develop his three-point shot. So I think uh, this summer, all the time he spent working with DeMar DeRozan is going to really pay off in a much-improved Patrick Williams. You know, he had had a freak injury last year where where he hurt his hand, you know, on a flagrant foul play, uh, I, I don't think that I would consider him to be a, an injury-prone type of guy. I think that, you know, he played almost every game in his rookie season, and I, and I think that he'll be a guy who's going to come in and make a big impact right from the start. And he's critical to their success because, you know, they, they kind of flirted with trying to sign Danilo Gallinari, who would have been another power forward that they could have used. They didn't really make a move in the draft for a power forward like I thought they would. Instead, they went with Dale and Terry. So if you look at the depth chart, their backup power forward is probably either Derek Jones Jr. or Devontae, Javante Green, so they're very undersized. Patrick Williams needs to play, and he needs to play significant minutes for this team to get where they need to go. Where do you think his ceiling is? Because in the beginning of last season, or kind of towards the middle, when people were starting to compare him to like a baby Kawhi, obviously, where do you think his ceiling is so far based off of how he's developed and what his work ethic has been like? Yeah, I think that's always unfair when when people compare 
uh, a young player to somebody who's one of the best forwards in the game. I mean, I, I know it's just what we do in the media. So you're always looking for a comparison. I mean, Stacy even calling him the paw yeah. instead of the claw. So yeah. Stacy's putting that pressure on him too. But uh, I don't think, I don't know that he's ever going to be the offensive player that you see out in LA with uh, Kawhi Leonard and Paul George. And of course, LeBron James, but the fact that he has that long wingspan, he has the big hands, he can score in transition. Uh, he's a good defensive player. I think he can be a really valuable two-way piece. Um, I think that I, I don't know that he's ever going to reach the level where you consider him for all-star appearances or anything like that. But the Bulls don't need him to be an all-star, especially in these next couple of years when they still have DeMar DeRozan on the squad. You've got two elite 25 per, points per game scorers in DeMar and Zach Levine. You don't need uh, big points from Patrick Williams, but you do need him to be a force on the defensive end. You need him to pick up his defensive rebounding, and you need him to run the court with Lonzo and get some easy baskets in transition. So I think he's going to be a critical piece for them this year. You know, he's still so young. He's going to turn 21 in a couple of weeks. You know, he's just scratching the surface at his NBA potential. Who knows? Maybe he does develop into an all-star down the road. But I think that that he can be a very good player. I remember in that draft, the Bulls were higher on him than, than a lot of teams were. Initially, he was projected to be late lottery. And they took him at number four. I remember hoping that LaMelo Ball, because remember when ended up going into that draft, a lot of people had concerns about LaMelo Ball, about his attitude and being kind of aloof about the game. He went three to Charlotte. I was hoping he was going to drop to the Bulls. But that didn't happen. They did get his brother, who's not quite as good as LaMelo. But uh, uh, hopefully Patrick Williams will turn out to be a very good pick at four. Did, did he detail any of his um, workouts with you by any chance? With, that he, was he, did, he, did, he didn't go into great detail. He talked about the fact that he did a lot of weight, a lot of weight training. But that was the first thing they would do. He said that they were out in Los Angeles, and uh, he said he had to fight traffic to get out there. And, and they said uh, 5 in the morning they were in the weight room doing lifting. And then they would do some spot shooting and do some game situation stuff. And then he said, I asked him if they played one-on-one. He said, oh, yeah, we played one-on-one. He didn't want to give any details as to how well he did. I, I'm sure uh, DeMar was able to get him off his feet a lot with those pump fakes. Yeah. But, uh, you know, if if Patrick was paying attention, I said, I'm sure he was. Hopefully we'll see some of those uh, great subtle moves that DeMar is able to show in the mid-range in Patrick's game this year. And Casey Johnson uh, reported earlier that the Bulls planned to Los Angeles area for a group workout with Zach, Damar, uh, Caruso, Kobe, Io, and Patrick Williams. So I think them just kind of trying to build chemistry and hopefully Patrick picks up some more stuff with working out with Zach and Damar and like a team setting of more just the one-on-one stuff. Yeah, I mean, that's always been a key is to get guys together in the summer. Uh, Stacy told stories about back when he was playing, guys would come to the gym in August and September and start working out to get ready for training camp. And that builds that camaraderie in the group. It gets guys in peak shape for the start of training camp and, you know, gives you a chance to work on some chemistry that the Bulls didn't always get a chance to do last year because, remember, Patrick Williams missed almost all of the season with the hand injury and then Caruso and Lonzo missed a good chunk of the second half of the season. So to get these guys together, to get a better feel for what players' strengths are in terms of their individual games can only lead to benefits once they report for training camp in late September. Mark, you've seen some uh, some great Bulls teams. Um, and we talked about chemistry. And when I'm looking around the league, uh, teams that were expected to be able to compete for a championship, you see – uh, there seems to be some friction in uh, different teams around the league. Uh, players not happy with where they're at, uh, not getting along with uh, one another. How important is it for uh, guys uh, when you're trying to build that camaraderie to uh, get along in order to be effective and produce something of quality on the court? Well, basketball is the ultimate team game. You have to have five players, kind of as Tom Thibodeau used to say, tied together on a string. His, his uh, analogy was mostly about the defensive end, but it works that same way on offense. Players have to know what the other guy is going to do. They have to trust that the screen is going to be there. They have to know that when they back cut and get open, that the ball is going to be passed to them. They're not going to just be exerting that effort with no reward for it. 
And, and I think that chemistry is crucial to any championship team. Yeah, there's examples throughout the course of NBA history where teams didn't get along and still were able to achieve high levels of success. But I think that when you can have that, that chemistry on the floor where you have a good feel for what your teammate is going to do and know that he's always going to have your back if you got beat on defense, that the team's just going to play at a much higher level. And I think that's why we've seen the whole Kyrie Irving saga, you know, on – unveil itself where he's been at multiple teams over the last several years and always seems to wear out his welcome because as great a player as he is individually, and he's one of the most spectacular ball handlers and shot creators there is from that guard position we've ever seen. He can't play in a team concept. You know, he made the the, the movie, the, the uncle drew movies. And I guess he feels like, uh, you know, that that's what he's going to be when he, when he gets older, but you know, he kind of has that I'm the man kind of mentality and, he played with one of the greatest players of all time in LeBron James and still felt that he should have gotten more shot attempts and should have gotten more recognition and ultimately forced his way out to Boston. And he told the folks in Boston that he's going to sign an extension the next summer and bolted from there. Uh, you know, he's been a, a walking train wreck everywhere he's gone. And, you know, you kind of wonder, Kevin Durant hasn't spoken publicly since he made the trade request, but you wonder if there's been a falling out between those two. Cause remember, it was Kyrie Irving who convinced Kevin Durant to join him in Brooklyn. And as of yet, you know, they haven't gotten deep into the playoffs with those two as their headliners. Right. Now that's a, a report saying that Kyrie wanted to stay in Brooklyn this season with or without Durant. So that definitely brings speculation on whether they had a, some type of falling out. Yeah. I'm really curious. Uh, it'll be when Kevin Durant finally does talk, it'll be interesting if he sheds any light on what the relationship is like with Kyrie Irving. Of course, now there are reports that Brooklyn might just uh, decide not to trade him and go to training camp with the roster that they have. And, you know, they have a very good team, obviously. Uh, we haven't seen what Ben Simmons might look like with that group. Of course, he didn't play at all last year, but an incredibly talented guy at 6'10", who's not a good shooter, but does so many other things on the court that he might fit in really well with two offensive minded players like Durant and Irving. So people are giving up on Brooklyn. If they can get Kevin back in the fold, they'll definitely be one of those teams that's going to be competing for the Eastern conference title. I'm yeah. excited to tell you about the, uh, the additions that they, the Bulls have made. In terms of free agency. Yes. Yeah, I mean, you know, they didn't really do all that much. Uh, there was some talk that maybe with the mid-level exception, they would go out and try to sign a, somebody who could bring some shooting. That was one of the areas where the Bulls ranked near the bottom of the league, both in terms of three-point attempts uh, per 48 minutes. And, and individually, they didn't have a lot of guys other than Lonzo Ball, who was out injured, who were among the league leaders in three-point field goals attempted. And, and it shot it at a good percentage. You know, we mentioned they looked at Danilo Gallinari. It was between Boston and the Bulls, and he decided that Boston had a better chance to win a title, and he also shared some family history where I guess his dad was a big Celtics fan, so he had some personal reasons for wanting to go to Boston. But, you know, they didn't really get anybody to help them with shooting. Uh, Andre Drummond is a guy who was a great rebounder. He led the league multiple times during his days in Detroit. He had some huge 2020 games against the Bulls uh, back in those days, and he's only 28 years old, but – he doesn't really fit the model of rim protector, uh, rim runner that uh, most teams want out of the center position right now. I was kind of surprised that that was the type of center that they went for, but obviously they feel like he can play a role in Billy Donovan's system. Dragic, you know, we talked about he's 36 years old and his best years are well behind him. And, and the, the glut of guards they have, not really sure where he fits. Derek Jones Jr., they brought him back after they couldn't get Gallinari. I like him as a hustle player. You know, he's a spectacular dunker, and if they can get that fast break going, maybe he can have a roll off the bench. But they really didn't add that much. Um, Dalen Terry is a developmental player who they took in the draft, and they took a guy – well, they didn't draft, but they signed Justin Lewis out of Marquette, who's a, a nice-looking prospect who is a Patrick Williams-type body. He's about 6'7", 235. I think he could be a surprise, and I'm looking forward to see what he does with the Windy City Bulls this year and maybe potentially earning NBA minutes down the road. Man, Mark, I was I was uh, excited about the drum and <laughs> bringing drum and then as far as uh, not not relying on um, uh, Bradley uh, as our our backup center, 
Um, but so do you feel like a, a lot of the issues that the Bulls have, they just feel like they're going to be able to solve them internally? Well, it just depends if Billy's going to commit to going with a bigger group in that second unit. You remember last season, part of it was because of injuries, but also it's Billy's preference to go small. There were times where Derek Jones was playing center surrounded by four guards with the second unit. So I don't know if, if Billy really has it in his mind that he's going to go big with that second group. You know, they're going to play Andre Drummond. I mean, he has he has a resume in the league. He played pretty well. You know, he split last season between Philadelphia and Brooklyn. He did some good things last year. As I mentioned, he's only 28 years old. This is not a player who's washed or over the hill and, and can't contribute. It's just that knowing what Billy Donovan likes in terms of style of play, I'm not sure that Drummond is the ideal addition. You know, you know, Billy always talks about he and AK have great communication. They talk every day. So I'm sure that Billy gave him the go-ahead and bring in Drummond on board. And I'm sure they have a plan for how they're going to use him. I just don't know in today's NBA whether or not he's going to be a perfect player because you've seen in the last couple of seasons where Drummond would, would be on the floor a lot during the regular season but wouldn't play as much in the playoffs because teams would put him in high pick and roll and he wasn't able to move his feet well enough to defend out there. We'll see. You know, I mean, I, I did see his comments on social media. He seems fired up about coming to Chicago. Some players uh, – are intimidated by the legacy of, of the Jordan era and in, in those six championships. But it seemed like Drummond was pretty pumped up to uh, join the Bulls. So maybe this will be a, a rebirth for him and, and he'll have a really good season. Uh, I, I wouldn't discount the fact that he can contribute off the bench. I just don't know if he's a perfect fit for what Billy Donovan likes to do as a coach. You talked about um, how the Bulls have this log jam at guard and Justin just brought up Tony Bradley. Uh, with Andre Drummond being there and Booch, do you think you know, Bradley may get packaged in a trade with Kobe White, or do you think Billy would keep Tony Bradley around for like matchups where Andre Drummond is just not quick enough to stay with the other team center? Yeah, Tony Bradley will get a lot of time sitting at the end of the bench clapping his hands. That will be his role <laughs> for the upcoming season. Tony Bradley does not figure. And, and you know, when they signed him initially, I thought he could be okay as a backup center. But, uh, you know, he, he did not do the things they need either as a shot blocker or as a rebounder or as a defender. So I just feel like, you know, Billy soured on him pretty quick. Remember a couple of years ago, uh, he soured on Daniel Gafford, who I think could have real value on this team as a rim runner and a guy who could block some shots. But Billy, for whatever reason, I, I must have been a work ethic kind of issue. He didn't think that Gafford was working hard enough. Gafford kind of got buried, fell out of the rotation, then was sent along in that trade, uh, the three-way trade with Washington and Boston. And I think the same thing happened to Tony Bradley. Uh, he, he, Billy decided he couldn't help, and he said, you know, go sit down at the end of the bench and uh, we'll call you if we need you. And I think it'll be the same situation this year. You know, you can, you can suit up 15 guys now and – and he'll be he'll be over there at the end of the bench uh, cheering on his teammates. One of the things that uh, I think is lost on a lot of people, uh, especially with how the Bulls fared in the playoffs, was the fact that um, uh, that uh, you had Zach who was dealing with injury, uh, but still going out there, they're giving it his, his all. But when we saw him and Demar playing, there was a synergy that at least I think existed between the two of them where. Uh, they weren't necessarily um, – one wasn't necessarily trying to look for their shots more than the other. They they seem to play very well with each other. Uh, do you think that it's fair to expect the same kind of year that DeMar had uh, for this upcoming year? Is, is that something that can be recreated in your opinion? I don't think it's likely that he's going <laughs> to have the same kind of season he had last year. You know, he turns 33 – uh, he's played a long time in the league. He came into the league at 19, you know, so this is going to be his 15th season, I think, 14th or 15th season. Uh, that's a lot of mileage on those tires. And, you know, the guy's in great shape. We saw him out in the Drew League uh, this summer putting up big numbers. So he's going to be a very good player, you know, probably another all-star season. But to expect him to average close to 28 points a game again this year, I think is unrealistic. Hopefully Zach can stay healthy. He averaged just under 25. His numbers dropped off after he had the knee problem late in the year. But if both those guys can average around 25, I, I think that that makes sense. Maybe get a little more production out of Vooch and Patrick Williams uh, this season. I think that that gives you a nice offensive balance. 
And, you know, going into last year, a lot of people wondered whether two mid-range players like Zach and DeMar could coexist, but there were no issues that way. The guys get along really well. They, their, their talents seem to complement one another. I think that that partnership will continue to thrive. I think it's the other parts of the roster where you're looking for improvement if they're going to try to reach that goal of being a top four team in the East. Speaking about Vooch, he gets so much hate, <laughs> pretty much unnecessarily online, a uh, lot from Bulls fans. Do you think Vooch will have a better season than he did last season, even though I didn't think he had a particularly bad season? Yeah, he still averaged double-figure rebounds, which is which is good. There weren't that many players around the NBA who did that. I thought he was a, a very solid defensive rebounder. You know, he's good at setting screens. He plays a good role in the offense in terms of being able to pass off pick and roll situations. The thing that people got disappointed with, you know, he's one of their volume three point shooters and he shot it at a low percentage last year. When you look at a guy who's seven feet tall, you know, I know Stacy all the time in the broadcast would say, get him down in the post, take advantage of size mismatches and get some easy baskets inside. But the way Billy was was running his system, especially since you know, they wanted to keep the lane free for DeMar and Zach to drive to the basket. They wanted to use Vooch as an outlet, as a three-point shooter. He just didn't shoot them as well as he has over the course of his career. And, he, you know, he's also in a situation where even though he's he's over 30, it's not a situation where, you know, he's got a lot of injuries and he has trouble getting up and down the court. I think he can still be an effective player. Hopefully he knocks down that three ball at a higher percentage this year. And I think part of the reason why so many fans on Twitter – and fans at large were critical of him is, is the price they had to pay to get him. You know, they gave up Wendell Carter, who was a high pick in the draft, plus two first-round draft picks. That's a lot to give up. Carter had a nice year in Orlando last year, and you think, you know, here's a young big man who can run the floor and block shots who would fit in really well with this team. Now we've got an older center who struggles in pick-and-roll coverage and isn't shooting the ball that well. I think that's why some people were down on him. It's not just the fact that, he didn't produce maybe as high as at a level as people expected. It's just that they gave up so much. You know, poor, uh, Orlando used that first pick for Franz Wagner, who had a really nice rookie season, a 6'10 wing guy who the Bulls could have used. And the Bulls still owe them a first round pick next year. So they, they gave up a lot to get Booch. And if, if they never get beyond the first round of the playoffs while he's in a Bulls uniform, you'd have to consider that trade a failure. Do you think he's going to be better this upcoming season? I mean, with the Magic, he was used to being like the number one option. And I think also that has a lot to do with it, too, just getting used to a newer role. And as you said, like him clearing the lane for Zach and Damar Iso. Do you think that with this whole continuity thing and getting used to each other and how they play play well together, do you think that he'll he'll do better this season? I hope so. I hope so. The Bulls really need him. Because as we mentioned, they didn't add any three-point shooting. Dragic is an okay three-point shooter, but he is at the latter stage of his career. I don't think anyone should expect too much from Goran Dragic in terms of putting up big numbers from the three-point line. So Vooch, they need Vooch to knock down those threes to keep defenses honest. And it's a contract year for him. So he wants to show the rest of the NBA he still has something to, to offer. Uh, one of the interesting things about his contract is his salary actually went down this season. So – uh, he's he wants to get one more big deal before he decides to retire, and and I think that it's important for him to put up good numbers this year. So I think I think Bulls fans will see the best of uh, Nikola Vucevic this year. We asked some of our followers questions they would like to ask you, and this one is from Dale. He asks, "Do you think Dale and Terry will make a?" impact with the Bulls this season what aspects does he need to grow well we appreciate the question uh, we kind of answered that earlier in the show um, just talking about the fact that his mechanics on his outside shot need some work I think that's something the coaches will really work with him throughout this summer and into training camp to try to get more consistency with his release get it off quicker and be more consistent from three-point range because as a six seven player you know, he could play some small forward. He can play some shooting guard. Yeah, he could even fill in that point guard uh, if, if they were in a real pinch there. I think that he's just going to have to make his offensive game more well-rounded, and he's going to have to spend time in the weight room getting stronger. Um, I think he'll probably see some minutes 
in the G League this year. Hopefully can build up some confidence, putting up some big offensive games against that level of competition and, and maybe take that into his second year where he can be more of a contributor with the parent bulls. Okay, let's take another one. John and C. Red asks, hello, Mark. Could you share with Bulls Nation your experience as a young journalist covering the 1993 NBA Finals? Sure. I mean, obviously, I was here for covering all six uh, Bulls championship runs. 1993 was the year that Charles Barkley won MVP and, of course, went up against his good buddy Michael Jordan. In the finals, the Bulls won the first two games in Phoenix, and it looked like they were just waltzed to that third championship. But then they only won one of the three games in Chicago. I had to go back to Phoenix. Of course, that's when John Paxson hit the big shot to bring the championship number three. But the one thing I remember most about the 93 finals, I remember I was sitting courtside with uh, Tim Weigel, who was the sports director at WLS Channel 7 at that point. And I was uh, a young guy on the staff. And <clears throat> Uh, I was there to kind of do some uh, color reporting in terms of doing features outside of the main game story. And we were watching this game, which was one of the best playoff games I'd ever seen, where Barkley and Jordan went back and forth at each other. It was a triple overtime game. Phoenix wound up winning that game, which ultimately led to a, the series being extended and going to a game six in Phoenix. And, you know, Barkley, you know, you talk about a recency bias when people talk about the greatest players of all time, they forget about Charles Barkley. Here was a guy that was 6'5", playing power forward. And, and you know, at his, in his prime, even at his size, he was an incredible athlete in terms of his speed and transition, being able to get up and down the court. Uh, he was an unbelievable player. And that duel between him and Jordan in the 93 finals was something I'll always remember. You mentioned you you covered all six. Which one was your favorite? Well, they were all they all had unique aspects to them. I, I think the 92 one was special. Stacy will tell you that story where, you know, they had a reserve group that started the fourth quarter. They were down double digits. And Stacy will tell you that, that Phil Jackson kind of gave up on the game. He was like, all right, I'll, 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 I'll go, we'll go put Stacy and Scott Williams and, you know, <laughs> the, the, the second group in. And those guys, Bobby Hansen, who was a, a journeyman veteran at that point, uh, hit a couple of big shots and then they – Scotty Pippen stayed with the, with the four reserves and they were able to cut that lead down to five or six. And then he brought Michael back and they came all the way back. And of course that was the wild celebration at the old Chicago stadium where he had Michael and all the players were dancing on the scorers table. Um, you know, when the bull, the bulls only won two of their titles in Chicago, the other four, they clinched on the road. So that was, that was really special. And, in, and the last one, of course, with Michael hitting the shot and holding the follow through, uh, Bob Costas with a great call saying that might be the last shot we ever see of Michael Jordan in an NBA uniform. Um, that's chilling. Every time I see that highlight, I, I have that framed photo in, in my man cave. And, you know, that's that's that was just a, a moment that I think every sports fan, any basketball fan who was alive and watching the NBA at that time will remember Michael Jordan in that shot in the 98 finals. That's like one of the most iconic finals yeah. moments in history. Let's see. Um, I think you had already answered this one, but I'm going to ask it for the show anyway. DeMarco asks, what is Dean's success for this season? Yeah, I think if uh, they can stay healthy, if Patrick Williams can take a big jump, I think they've got a chance to get a top four seed in the East. To me, that would be a success and advancing past the first round of the playoffs. If they could get to the conference semifinals, I personally would consider that a success. And then you take your chance, whether you're playing Boston, Milwaukee, Miami, Brooklyn, whoever you're playing in that second round, you take your shot. I think that's where they need to go. They need to show that this team can be – one of the heavyweight teams and a legitimate contender in the Eastern Conference, not one that's just happy to be there and, and to bow out quickly in the first round like they did this past year. I'm going to ask that same question um, for the Windy City Bulls since you know, we're looking at like they'll have Marco, uh, Dalen Terry, and Justin Lewis down there. 
I think Winnie City Bulls fans should be excited about those games too. It's always fun to watch the development of players that you think at some point can make a difference at the NBA level. And I, I think that that's always a big treat when you see a draft pick like a Dale and Terry play some games down there and give you a taste of what you might see in the NBA down the road. As, a, as we mentioned, there's no guarantee that Dale and Terry is going to spend a lot of time in the G League. It just when you look at the numbers on the current roster, you would think that they would try to give him some game experience by playing some really good competition in the G League. I mean, you, you see guys that were college stars that weren't drafted, uh, that have been in the G League for four, five, six years that are that are really good players, but they, they know that their their path to getting to the NBA is going to be difficult. There's some really good competition down there. And the key for the, the Windy City Bulls is, is, is how do you round out the rest of your roster? You have to make sure that you get a good point guard. Last year, they had Devon Dotson, who was outstanding for them. But Devon knew that his path to the NBA was blocked with the Bulls because of what we talked about with the glut of guards. So he played for the Wizards Summer League team. I'm not sure whether or not he's going to get an invitation to camp, but hopefully Devon gets an opportunity to play in the NBA at some point. There are a lot of great players that were college stars. I mean, Devon Dotson was a college player of the year in, in, in one of the many uh, uh, organizations that, that award that. And he's finding it difficult to get to the NBA. It just shows you how much, how much talent there is out there and how difficult it is to make it in the NBA. I think we have one more question. Uh, no, because you already answered Marco and Justin Lewis. Okay, so I guess that's all the questions from Twitter. Um, being a part of covering those six uh, championship teams and how close were you to, like, the floor where you, you could hear, like, Jordan trash-talking people? It's so loud during the finals, you can't hear any of that. I mean, during a Tuesday night game against a bad team, you might hear some of that stuff. But during the finals, it's just so loud. You're not going to pick up any of that any of that chatter. And most of the time, especially now, back then, the media was fairly close to the court. Now, they put the media way up there, <laughs> way up away from the court. Those seats are reserved for the people that are paying huge dollars, uh, the season ticket holders. And and some of the some of the national media that's covering the game. So yeah, those were the good old days back in the '90s when you could get a get a, a good vantage point for some of those games. Those days are long gone now. Um, can you describe the difference in the atmosphere between the old Chicago Stadium and the United Center? Uh, night and day. You know, the uh, old Chicago Stadium was was a relic. It was incredibly loud the fans were so passionate you felt like they were right on top of the action of course we've all heard the stories about uh, fights in the 300 level and, and, and people uh, smuggling in bottles of liquor and stuff I mean it was kind of an anything goes atmosphere it was uh, it was raw and it was a lot of fun and it really added to the whole mystique of that first three feet you know that it was just incredibly loud in there um, the the new uh, United Center became kind of antiseptic in ways. And when it, when it first opened, of course, that's when uh, Jordan went to play baseball. And, of course, that immediately dropped the interest level uh, for that first season. But then he came back and, and led the Bulls to three more titles. And it's it's a, I think over time it's really evolved into being a, a better arena than it was initially. But it's still not anywhere near as loud or as chaotic as the old stadium was. Mark, you can't just casually uh, drop in there that people were smuggling in alcohol. Do you, do you have any stories to go to go along with that? Well, I mean, not in terms of uh, the smuggling in alcohol, but just, you know, you would see the ushers having to go up in a 300 level and break up fistfights almost routinely. And, and it happened probably more in hockey games than it was for basketball, but you would see plenty of uh, people going at it as well. I mean, people paid their hard-earned money to get into the stadium, and, and they were going to enjoy the experience any way they could. So, yeah, it was it was a different atmosphere, and the whole area is different. You know, that that whole uh, Chicago Stadium, United Center area has has been revitalized in a lot of ways, and, and I think people feel a lot better about going to games now. Um, but, yeah, that atmosphere will never be duplicated. 
Um, it's right across the street, but it's a world away. And speaking of a chaotic situation, you have to like mediate, give me the hat sauce with big personality like Stacy. And then you never know what Timmy Whispers is going to say. <laughs> How is that experience with keeping them on track? Well, we have a ton of fun every week. Uh, we we normally tape on Thursdays. The show is released on Friday morning. Uh, we have a ton of fun. Uh, <clears throat> Stacy's, you had him on the show, and he's one of the best storytellers that you'll ever meet, whether you talk about athletes, entertainers. Uh, the guy has just an incredible personality. And, you know, some of the funniest stories he tells are, are stuff about growing up in Oklahoma, and, you know, go above and beyond his playing days with the Bulls. And there isn't, there isn't a show where we don't just – you know, fall out laughing at some point in it because uh, Stacy's a great storyteller, has a great sense of humor. Uh, we have fun with the guests that we bring on. Stacy has a, a great Rolodex of uh, athletes and entertainers that we're able to call on to join the show. And it's been, it's been a labor of love. We've been going at it. It'll be two years in November and the show keeps getting bigger and better. And we, we appreciate all the, our loyal followers who check it out and, you know, we've just over the last couple of months, we've brought it to Twitch to, so people can uh, check out the live experience. That's that still is in its infancy stages, but we're hoping to grow that as, as we continue to go. And we've got some potential partnerships that we're looking at in the coming months that will make the show even bigger and better. So big things on the horizon for the Give Me the Hot Sauce podcast. And we we appreciate uh, all of your viewers and listeners who enjoy that show as well. Yeah, it's a it's a great show. You all have that perfect mix of, um, of allowing Timmy Whispers to to say certain things and just just putting them back in the corner. Uh, but there is there is some type of um, background behind that name, Give Me the Hot Sauce, that you can share with us. Well, it's Stacy's trademark phrase. So well, I know that, that, but like as far as like that being the name, like was there anything that went into that, or was was yeah we automatic? we. We had thrown a, around a number of options that were like, you know, using Stacy's last name, King, you know, the King's Court, a uh, uh, n- number of different play on words off of King. And then finally I said, well, well, we're working too hard at this. We should just call it Give Me the Hot Sauce. Bam. And that was it. That was the show. So, you know, one, once I threw that out there, everybody just agreed. Yeah, that that's perfect because. You know, when Stacy's out in the grocery store or whatever, somebody's going to say to him, give me the hot sauce. That's that's his trademark phrase. And it also kind of summarizes the podcast. You know, you want a show that's got some energy, that's got some hot takes, that's got some hot sauce to it. So I think that name works on a variety of levels. So I think, uh, you know, in terms of trying to launch a podcast, people know Stacy, they know that phrase. And, and I think that gives them a good introduction to what the show is all about. And also was a good introduction for <laughs> Stacy Seven Hat Sauce. Um, yeah, that's true, and that's starting to grow too. I, I know that he's uh, he's trying to get that on the shelves uh, at at some uh, you know grocery store chains, and if he gets that going, look out. <laughs> <laughs> Which one's your favorite? Have you tried any of them? Oh, sure. Yeah, they're all good. Um, St. Pat's Verde, I think I, I, I enjoy, you know, that's good on, on any number of things, you know, Mexican food. Um, the, uh, I don't go for the, uh, the 1871. That's too hot for me. So <laughs> that's actually my favorite one. Yeah. I mean, when I go for wings, it's usually, I'm, I'm more of a mild sauce guy, but that they tried some that were literally like atomic sauces. And we had one guy that was helping out with the show that, 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 uh, that almost passed out the sauce was so hot for him. <laughs> Justin, do you have any questions you want to ask Mark? Uh, well, just in general with those sauces, uh, Stacy was giving me grief because I told him I hadn't tried the sauce yet. Um, but as far as you said, you, you're into the mild sauce. So, so what is that sauce that you, that you uh, usually have? Well, the original one isn't too, isn't too hot you know, the basic red sauce, but the St. Pat's Verde is the green sauce, the organic blend, which is really good. And you can use it on a variety of different dishes. So like I said, I'm more for the, for the mild than I am for the red hot stuff. And of course he's got, he's got his own barbecue sauce, which is very good as well. So 
they're all good. It's just a question of of your palate and uh, how hot you want to go. And for people who have not heard yet, the Bulls are throwing a party for Labor Day. Uh, Bulls Fest at the United Center, September 3rd through 4th. It's 33 more days away. Mark, do you plan on stopping by the Bulls Fest? I don't know yet, but uh, if, if there's something that they need me to help with or something going on, yeah, I might stop by. Tim uh, Tim Sinclair gave the same kind of answer. It was like, um, I might, but <laughs> they haven't informed me that they need me yet. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, if you're a Bulls employee like Tim, if they call, you got you got to be there. So, um, yeah, we'll see what's what's going on. And, yeah, I might check it out. Melissa, you have any questions you want to ask, Mark? Um, I, I asked Tim this, too, but do you have any advice for anybody looking to get into doing what you do? Yeah, I think right now media has changed so much from when I first got involved. Uh, it used to be very defined roles as you were, you were a reporter, you were a cameraman, you were a writer. Now you have to be everything. And I think that for people who are, you know, going into college and, and want to try to get into a career in media, you have to be able to do a little bit of everything. You have to be able to shoot in your own video. You have to be able to edit. You have to be able to master social media. You have to be comfortable on camera. You have to be a good writer. You know, you could, you could kind of cheat in some of those areas back in the day. Now, uh, prospective employers want full service. They want someone who can do everything and never uh, minimize the social media aspect. I think that any employer wants a strong presence on social media. So, um, you know, for people who are just fooling around with uh, trying their own, put together their own videos, just keep doing it. You know, you trial and error, uh, you find out what you're good at, find out what makes you happy and make sure that you get yourself out there because you can't wait for, for somebody to come call and you got to kind of have to break down the door. There's just so much competition in the media field that you have to establish a base of content that you've already created and show an employer that from day one, you can be a real asset. Um, you can't, you know, I think the days of kind of learning on the job and easing into it are kind of over. You have to hit the ground running. Uh, now, uh, they, what they have, what they call multimedia journalists. You're not just someone who's going to be a reporter and ask questions. You have to, you have to go and shoot your own video. You know, if you're on TV, you have to set up your own live report. It's, uh, it's a ton of work. It's, uh, it's much different from what, what I experienced when I first graduated from college, but um, that's the realities of the media market. So, you know, try as many different things as you can, be aggressive, and, you know, get yourself out there on social media. That's great advice. Thank you. All right, Mark, uh, I want to thank you for coming on to the show. It's an honor and a pleasure to have you as a guest uh, for our Everybody that's tuning in, you can catch Mark co-hosting Give Me the Hot Sauce every Thursday. Mark, uh, you know who's the guest for this Thursday? Yeah, we're going to have Tim Hardaway Sr., who's going into the Hall of Fame in September. So it'll be great to hear some of his stories of playing against the championship Bulls. Of course, his son, Tim Jr., is with the Dallas Mavericks right now. So it will, we'll have a number of things to talk with Tim about. And he's a Chicago guy, went to Carver High School. Yeah, great show. We're looking forward to it. And as always, we're always trying to get people to like and subscribe. You know the game. So we would encourage people to subscribe on YouTube and, and your favorite podcast carriers and, and to do the same with your shows. Appreciate that. Thank you. All right. Thank you for coming again, Mark. My pleasure. Best of luck with the show. And we're looking forward to a great season for the Bulls. Thanks so much, Mark. Thank you, Mark.